anybody has any questions throughout, um, I'm by no means a, like a professional in, in anything here. It's just I'm a player kind of foremost and gotten into the coaching, obviously, in the last couple of years with, with the younger age groups and stuff like that. But I'm still playing uh, at senior club level myself, so I definitely haven't gone into it. Um, in the higher level, you know, the elite level, like county um, intermediate or senior or anything like that. So um, if anybody has any questions throughout, um, again, like I said, I'm just a player, but um, I'm involved heavily with school. Obviously, I'm a PE teacher. So this is the age group that I deal with on a daily basis. And I see some of the problems that we face as coaches and as camogie coaches in particular. So um, I'll just start, if, if anybody has anything to ask beforehand, or if everybody's okay, I'll just get get going on it if that's all right so um basically so the, the first part i want to start with before i go into you know the the season and stuff like that is the club and school collaboration um not conflict basically what's been happening with we'll say our school and i've for the first year i've been the service and officer with kind of camogie and it's it deems kind of difficult enough when you know the players are coming into school saying i can't train today or i can't play this week or that week because I have a club match at the weekend and they're being told by kind of their coaches at home that they're not allowed to play with us the and there's no major collaboration there between us. So maybe going forward, this is something definitely the Camogie Association should look at. And if we had a master fixtures program like the Hurland does, so that there'd be a particular season for, you know, schools Camogie, colleges Camogie, um, club Camogie and then county Camogie because at the minute, obviously, and because of COVID as well, it's sort of all over the place, but um, it would be nice to have a master program in place that you know that you have their full attention kind of from September to December and then they move on to the clubs. So basically, if there's a continuous crossover, then it might cause burnout to, to the players and the emotional uh, loyalty as well from players like that they're afraid to say that they can't play or they're afraid that they let down their, their team with the school or with, with the club and stuff like that. And also this impacts on the well-being because it's pressure on them on top of pressure. So basically, the lines of communication need to be open there and that will make it an awful lot easier for us to plan our seasons ahead, whether it's club or schools or, you know, um, in county level. OK, so um, I'll move on from that. And um, actually, just quickly going back to that, um, the reason I, I brought this slide in was because, like I said, I've seen it in our own school and, you know, some teachers might have like first years this year and they mightn't have they might have leave inserts the following year. There's no kind of straight lines and we don't know what other teachers are doing in certain years or same way in a club level. I might be over the under sixes this year and then I might be asked to take the under 12s next year. So there's no actual set kind of like who who what is is doing what, if, if you know what I mean. So um, Damien Coleman has actually doing a, doing a pilot scheme with our school, our community school, and we're trying to get, you know, a program in place that um, first years right up to third years have an athletic development program, and then they move on a little bit further, um, you know, into their strength and conditioning once they go into kind of fourth, fifth, and sixth year. So if anybody wants to ask me any questions on that later, we have, we're setting up a, a pilot program for that. Now, just moving on. So, so um, again, this is the 13 to 17-year-olds and I spoke to my own kind of uh, students and to the, the people that I coach, the kids that I coach, and asked them what did they think was most important as a coach. And as a player myself, I, I'd agree with every one of what they said. So they said that a coach should be approachable, um, you know, that they're not hard to talk to um, if they needed to say anything to them or that, um, that they would be fun, fun at training. Um, very professional and, you know, have cones and um, the session ready to rock and roll. If training was at seven, they were there and everything was laid out by seven. It wasn't like that they were sending them off on two laps while they were laying down cones at seven o'clock. Um, organized, that comes into the same thing. Knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the players themselves and of the game itself, you know, um, not trying to change up the game completely to what they think was right and taking the players, um, you know, opinions into consideration as well. And know the ability of the individuals and of the team as well and get the best out of the individual and as a team as well. So, um, and also as a coach, I think that you should have a realistic short-term and long-term goal as well and know what needs to be worked on. Now, this would obviously happen on the off-season just or just before you let, you know, your, um, your team off for the off-season that you would kind of ask them and get feedback from them to see what they think they would need to work on for the following season. But sometimes this doesn't work in clubs and in schools because you don't have that group of players the following year. 
Um, so this is why we kind of say it would be great if there was a program place, you know, that you knew who you had, what year. Um, and also you as the coach, you're the facilitator. Um, and there's definitely like parts of the micro and the macro cycles and the meso cycles, which I'll go into in a little bit um, later on. So basically at the beginning of your season, so just kind of you've got the job of the coach or the manager and this is what I would be suggesting kind of you do. Again, I'm not a professional in this now. This is from a player side of it that's been playing it a long time and um, gotten into the coaching in the last couple of years as well. So um, just put this out of the way a little bit so I can see. So um, screen them for their weaknesses in functional movements as a group. Um, so this would be at the end of, you know, the season, just when you had finished up, you could screen them and ask them where they thought um, they needed to improve on. And then that they would work on that on the off season themselves, just tipping away. Okay. Now you would also um, screen them, we'll say with a squat lunges, all those different types of functional movements. And as a group, you'd fitness test them as well. Just this is at the very, very beginning. So then you see, you can plan what you need to do because if they're flying fit, when you take the first fitness test or whatnot, um, there's no point in going straight into like a massive amount of cardio if, if they're fit already. Because again, you don't know where they're coming from. Are they coming from schools? Are they coming from county? Because every season is different for everyone now. It's not the same. So um, then I would suggest to organize and set up a strength and conditioning program based on the findings from their function movement um, and their fitness testing. And obviously speak with the relevant people that would be, um, you know, that that would be their forte. Because sometimes coaches, not every coach is a strength and conditioning coach. But that's the way the game has gone now. You know, you have to be, you have to move with the times as well. And there's plenty of strength and conditioning coaches out there. And there's also, you don't always have to be going out paying somebody, you know, sometimes the best resources are within the clubs themselves or within the schools, you know, that you just don't know about. So a lot of the time, you know, we give out about some of our coaches and stuff like that um, in a school or in a, a club context, but you can't shoot the kind of the volunteers, but we just have to try and train them up on different things and see where we can get our best resources. Um, have your backroom team in order. So your selectors, your, you know, uh, who, who's going to be with you for the year and people that you trust and that have a knowledge of the game. It doesn't necessarily mean that they had to be a great hurler or a great movie player to, to be a great, um, you know, selector, but just that they'd have a knowledge of the game. And I have just there in small brackets to promote the culture of, of Camogie as well. So um, there's nothing as bad as when you go to like a match and someone has black shorts on and green shorts and red shorts. And sometimes it's nice when your club colours are worn. And I sometimes would say at the beginning of the season, say you must wear your club colours come and train in, like they do in a, in a county setup. And it looks an awful lot more professional as well. So um, ensure you as the coach and any other trainers and backroom team are like qualified and vetted. And, um, you know, even if you're not, like I said, a great hurler or a great commodity player, that you have a knowledge of it and that you get, get some training, at least the foundation level course anyway. Just because you've a course done as well doesn't mean that you'll be able to coach it. But um, I do feel everybody has to have some knowledge of it. Um, also, what's kind of happening now is it, things are gone professional, even at, at, at the kind of the youth level. Um, a nutrition module or session um, and allocate this at the beginning. And the reason for this is I wouldn't be saying like for somebody to lose weight or gain weight. It's more for well-being and stuff like that, because an awful lot of youths, they don't eat breakfast. They don't, you know, they don't have a lunch. Um, so this all affects the game. And the whole reason we're here is to kind of promote the game and to get the best out of players. So definitely a nutrition module or even a basic, um, you know, one kind of session on nutrition. Uh, for them and that they would set up you know there's a my fitness pal on their phones and everything that they can there's plenty of resources out there again you don't have to be paying somebody to come in to do this um it's it's all readily available online as well um and then you have to check what facilities ha are available to you i know in our club we have um like a wall ball we've an astroturf there's you know and there's a couple of pitches there but this not, not might be available to you at, you know, at all times of the year. So you have to plan your season ahead, knowing what facilities are available to you. So if you have the Astro for two months, well, then you better have a session in place that is, you know, fit for the Astro and vice versa if it's for the wall ball or for the pitches or whatnot. Um, am I going too fast or is, is everybody with me there? Has anyone any questions so far or is everyone okay? Okay, I'm with me. Okay. Oh, good. 
Perfect. I'll I'll move on. Yeah. If, if anyone does any any questions, just type them into the chat box. I'll keep an eye on it, and I'll I'll, I'll put the questions to you for uh, uh, if there's a pause. Lovely. Um. So the whole season, then this is the macro cycle. It's the annual plan. Um, now, you have to be flexible to this because it can change throughout the year. Um, obviously, um, being involved with the Connacht Colleges, we were supposed to play our Connacht finals this, this week. And obviously, because of the storm, things had to be changed. So you, you have to be open and be flexible that things can change and it won't stick rigidly to, to plan. Um, injuries as well um, and commitments to other sports can, can also alter the macro cycle. Um, and it can be broken down into different stages as well. No, the preparation that's at the bit the beginning of the of the um the season and this is building up kind of their aerobic capacity so that's basically the pre-season um i'll go into it in a little bit more then you have the pre-competition this can be kind of optional where you'd you know offer some challenges and stuff like that and just fine tuning it as well then the competition stage where you'd be tapering down you know you wouldn't be doing as many long runs and stuff like that it'd be all short fast speed and fine tuning like um you know it's short fast drills and um like match kind of mirroring what would come up in a match and then the transition then is kind of the stage where you're off or you're 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 on the off season so you're taking time off and knowing what to do and for psychological reasons as well you need time off and it is nice uh, for the player to have time off and sometimes you know with, with the way with covid the there was the county set up then it went into the club and a lot of these players got no break at all. So you just have to be aware of what's going on and what competitions are going on and know how to plan for your competition yourself and probably know what, you know, when the players are coming back to you, who has trained, who hasn't. But you'll know that at the very beginning once you do fitness testing and stuff to see how you can plan ahead. Now, um, so in the preseason, like the whole idea of the preseason is like um, to prepare players for the demands of the game. And the technical side of the game, the tactical, the physical and the psychological. And all this will be done, um, you know, focusing on game based activities to improve their fitness. So the day of the, you know, the 10 laps or 20 laps of the pitch, all that is gone now. You have to be more creative with, you know, preseason training and stuff like that. And again, no two players are the same. Somebody will have a lot more higher fitness levels coming into the preseason than somebody that hasn't, you know, trained in six or seven weeks. So you have to be, you know, everyone has individual needs and also for the team. So um, with this as well, you know, with the preseason, you can change the pitch, pitch dimensions, you know, make things smaller, make it uh, game based. And sometimes it's a lot easier as a player when, you know, you're not doing the big long runs. I know you have to do a certain amount, but um, when it's game based, it's a lot easier. And psychologically, it's a lot easier to train if you know that, you know, it's not going down and you're going to be slugged, you know, throughout a training session. So, um, and in season then, again, these objectives will um, be to reduce the volume of what you're doing, but keep the intensity as high. So you won't, like I said, um, you won't be doing massive amounts of um, long runs. You won't be doing massive amounts of short sprints either. It'll be all kind of game-based and fast and furious kind of training sessions coming into the, you know, the season and getting ready, fine-tuning yourself for that. And you will also, I've written there, um, focus on implementation of your game plan. So whether you're going to be doing a running game, if you're going to be playing with sweepers through the season, because a lot of that doesn't just happen overnight. It kind of takes place on the training field. So you need to plan for the group that you have and know what kind of goals you have. Like a lot of people think that, you know, OK, let's go out and try and win the county final. But realistically, you know, for you know, 90% of, you know, the, the clubs and stuff like that, they, they won't get within kind of a NASA's roar of a county final. But you have to push them to get, you know, the best out of them and work with what you have, the resources, what you have, um, and with with your team. So um, just moving on then again to the off-season. Um, I had mentioned previously um, that on the off-season, that you would talk to them just before you'd kind of let them go or release them once they'd be finished for the season onto where they thought they could improve or what they could do for the following season to, you know, maybe get that little step further towards, you know, getting to semifinals or quarterfinals or even making, getting out of the group could be a goal for certain teams. So a needs analysis on the individuals and as a team before the actual season ends, and this will focus, like I said, their improvement, what they can be at during the off season. So let's just say if somebody was, you know, poor on their left-hand side and 
you know, all the training in the world during the year wasn't like wasn't going to help them doing that unless they were working on it themselves as well. So um, body composition as well. Somebody might be carrying a little bit excess um, weight and that is, you know, hindering them um, with fitness. So they're kind of faltering the last five or 10 minutes of a game. So you can, you know, tell them what to do on their time off as well. Flexibility and different different um, things like that that they can work on, um, depending on the player, of course. Now, um, players that don't play other games as well should be encouraged to keep fit um, during the off season. And while I said as well, it's very important to have the break as well because there's nothing as bad as feeling like oh, I have to tug out again tonight and you know not having any break at all. And normally the breaks could be anywhere um, between three and six weeks um, for a player. So before every session as a coach, um, you know, this is what I would say that you should do. Um, ask, was it enjoyable? Um, was there challenging aspects to the session? Um, did the session mirror the game? Were all the players involved? Was it player-centered and was there decision-making? Now, all these are the six principles that we would um, have for the game. And, you know, if you can in every session, to make it as enjoyable as you can for the, the players, all of these principles should try and be present if at all possible. Now, um, when I'm training um, teams as well, and whether it's under eights or um, youths, I always use the traffic light, light system on myself as well. So basically, um, I would ask them at the end of the session, so like who feels that they gave 100% and really enjoyed the session, um, stand over at the green light. And then who felt they could have given it a little bit more and who felt that they didn't enjoy the session at all and didn't, um, you know, enjoy it or didn't perform. And that way you're getting feedback on your own session and you're getting feedback from them as well. And then they're feeling like they have a voice at training as well that you care and, you know, that you can for the next session. If someone said, no, I felt there was too much running it. Well, then, you know, you think for your next session, you're planning your next session, your micro session. Um, that's where you kind of might look at and not have as much running or use the ball a little bit more, um, you know, so that they think psychologically they're not doing as much. Um, if if you understand what I'm saying on that, it definitely works really well. I, I use it a lot in PE class as well um, to get feedback from them, to get them talking. Has anyone any questions so far? No, I've I've kind of been flying through it now, I hope. Um, um, Sinead McNeil is my name, Ms. Valley Bones and Dennis. How are, you? Um, just, how are you guys? It's very, very insightful. Just on the off season, um, can you give us a bit more of a, you know, from your perspective, how much time you should be given? I'm talking teenage girls now uh, yeah. for that off season. Um, I just, I just insight because of her different views, and I suppose just trying to, yeah, get your perspective on it. Um, I, I'll give it to you uh, um, from the perspective of a player myself. First of all. Um, like we have just finished the championship there um, exactly three weeks ago. And I, I've just really enjoyed the last three weeks being off resting and, and kind of not doing anything. And it's, you know, as in totally taking time off. But now I feel like I'm itching to get back now, but yet the season won't be starting until, you know, probably February, you know, with with all that's going on. And the county comes, or the club league is coming first, then county, and then it's going back to, a club championship so I wouldn't leave it any longer than kind of four to six weeks I think is is a long break now in terms of the youths that I'm coaching at the minute um they finished in August and um, I wasn't coaching them then but I was asked to take them on for strength and condition there three weeks ago they haven't trained since August and it's been way too long of a gap so I'd, I'd be taking the same kind of maybe four to six weeks is, is loads of loads of time to have off and rest. And even during that time that you would ask them that they would be doing at least kind of 30 minutes, three times a week of some form of activity. You know, um, we always use the 10,000 steps mark as just, that's like getting out of bed. That shouldn't even come into it. They should be doing 10,000 10, steps um, anyway. But in, in terms of taking rest, I think four to six weeks. Now that's um, like, I'm not an expert in it, but in terms of them losing interest and and that any longer than that, they kind of do start to lose interest and their fitness levels goes after a few weeks as well. Now there's muscle memory, it does come back to them, but um, I feel it's good for them to um, have some form of a session after kind of definitely six weeks. Great. Cheers, thanks for that, insightful. No problem. Just and on that, if I, in, in terms of, does it, in your opinion, does that, does that have to always be camogie? 
or have you, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you ever used anything else over the off season to get them together as a group, but not have it quite so so pressured? Oh well, yeah, well, um, the group that I'm doing at the minute, like we do, I they don't have their hurls with them. It's just kind of almost like an aerobics class, but um, we're just having fun at it, if you know what I mean. But they're still working out very, very hard. But in their heads, they're not under pressure. Does that make sense? So. Um, Can I just ask quickly, because like my own daughter is in that age group and she's training soccer on a Monday after school, um, camogie on a Tuesday after school, GAA on a, on a Thursday. That's without any matches on the off season as such. So and I, again, I know that's not for every player, but do you yeah. still feel to get the session in then, even though it is class as the off season? Well, um, yeah, it is class as off season, but she's still kind of training three and three and four nights a week. Yeah. And, and that's that's the whole reason kind of why I was saying the collaboration between clubs and, you know. I know, I think that's brilliant if that goes forward. Well, we're going to be pushing for it anyway, for sure. But um, you have to make sure as well that what happens then is they don't give 100% to any session, if that makes sense, because they're kind of in their head, they're saying, oh, geez, I've trained tomorrow. Oh, I've trained the next day. You know, I can't. I can't go too hard. So what they end up doing is they end up falling between the whole lot of them and, and mm -hmm. not giving anything 100%. So I know that um, when I was involved with um, with County Camogie and I just I played for a season with the footballers as well. And when we'd go training, um, sometimes with the footballers, we'd be leaving training and going straight to Camogie training. And psychologically, you'd be drained kind of after. So it is hard for people that are training kind of a couple of different nights a week in different sports. It's hard to give it everything. Do you know? We we yeah, have it's just I know in our club in our club level, like ninety over ninety percent of the girls are that way. So that's where I'm trying to think of the balance. You know. Well, I think if you like, if yourselves, um, if you could meet with the coaches of the um, like of the soccer and whatnot, like this program that myself and Damien Coleman are doing in in our school, it's trying to work together with the clubs so that we would do the strength and conditioning through the school for the clubs. So everybody's a winner. So they're, right. they're not coming in doing strength and conditioning with us and then going home doing strength and conditioning later that evening. So there's a kind of, there's a probably a proper pathway for them. Like that's what we're trying to do. If, Thank if you. They, do you get me? So that they're yeah. not just randomly training, like doing sprints tonight and doing a few lunges tomorrow and that it's, there's no structure to it. So definitely if you can collaborate with the clubs that they're training with, and you know, tell them what they're doing. You know, coaches are they're willing and and you know to help. You know, they're not there just to flog because I know sometimes um, with players as well. Um, you know, with the county players, there's an awful a divide at times between county and club players because, especially with the way it's been done at the minute, because we we'll say county players come back into the club, and the next thing. The poor creator that has been training all year is fired to the side yet they'd get played playing for the league and then they're fired aside. So there's a balance as well and that you have to get the players that are with the club train yeah. and, and, and up to the level of the county girls because when the county girls come back in or county lads or whatever, um, you know, they come and they take their spot straight away without having trained with the club. So that might be something we need to, you know, kind of maybe spend another time looking at. Brilliant, thank you. That's another day's work. <laughs> yeah, no. that's okay so we've, we've got one, one minute left and I just on, on that I understand Claire in terms of sometimes you as a parent have to be the one speaking to them all because sometimes I know our, our uncle have the same and, and the J club feel it's always them tapering down sessions or making the miss and the soccer and the rugby and the basketball don't do it so you as a parent will sometimes have to do that because sometimes coaches don't know and they get frustrated if they don't know that someone's yeah. played soccer the day before like they, they just generally won't know sometimes so you're absolutely right. Um, last one, 30 seconds. Best fitness test for under 14s? Bleep test, yo-yo, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would say the yo-yo the, the yo -yo test is very, very good. Yeah, the yo-yo. Even though we've, we've been doing the beep test um, throughout, um, and it's, it's you know, sub-maximal, so they can start off gently. But I think the yo-yo test is a real, real good one for the cardiovascular. But it, if you're not sure of their fitness levels, I would start with the beep test. Nice work. We're going back to the main room, folks. We'll have some more question and answer in there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a minute.